Well, uh, we are diving in a little bit deeper today into what we're calling our love allergy. Everybody say love allergy. Uh, what is a love allergy? Uh, it's well, it's our sermon series for the month of February, but it it is uh, it's what we're calling a theology of love. And a theology is not about what we think about love; it's about what God thinks about love. And so we're trying to approach the Bible as if maybe we were approaching it without all the outside influence, without everything already being decided. And so we together are asking God as we approach the scripture this month to show us what love is all about. So last week we started out with two things. The first thing we discovered is that the ultimate value in the Bible is love. I mean, you know, that's the case. Jesus said that people will know that we're his disciples by the way we love one another. Uh, Paul even told us that we could have the gift of prophecy, give everything we have to the poor, but if we don't have love, then we're really nothing. So the ultimate Bible, uh, Bible value, the ultimate value in the Bible is love. And, in the, and then we talked about last week kind of our foundational statement, and without this, we don't have anything, and that is the fact that God is love. Everybody say it with me. God is love. Now, love is not the deity that we worship, and not all love is God, but God is love. Our God is love, and he can't help himself. Do you, do, do you know that? Do you know that? He, he, you say this morning, well, Pastor Doug, I've messed up. Well, listen, God is love, and his love doesn't depend on your identity. It depends on his. It, it is who he is, and he can't help himself. He is love sick. He's got a case of the so loves. God didn't just love the world. He so loved the world. And he loves you. Now, now today we're going to take it just a little bit deeper. And uh, I'm going to start with a, a, a base statement. Uh, I've entitled today's talk, Made for Love. Everybody say this, I was made for love. That's right, you were made for love. So this is our base statement. Here it is. God made you for what? For love. He created love for you, and he created you for love. Now, I know that sounds simple, but, but, it, but it's really, really profound. Now, I could talk about a lot of different aspects of love today. Of course, we could build a whole series just on the fact that God loves us. We talked about that last week. But there are other types of love other than even the, the love of God that God has created you for. You were built to experience God and to experience love even beyond the love of God. The love uh, that God offers us is a very expansive thing. So I, so I want you to get this. God built you for relational. Everybody say relational love. Now, all relationships are a part of this. God wants you to experience the love of a family, the love of friendship. But God built you for relational love. Now, uh, the most sought-after relational love on this earth, uh, beyond the, uh, other than our relationship with Christ, is something called romantic love. Loving and being loved by a member of the opposite sex. Now, it may shock you to hear this basic fact because it's basic. It's a basic loveology, but I want you to get this. God built you for romantic... Oh, it's going to be a good Sunday. Look at somebody around you. I'm glad I came. What is he going to talk about today? I'm trying to... It's going to be a good Sunday... God built you for romantic love. Now, you were created for the love of God. You were created for the love of his church. You were created for the love of family. You were created to, to, to be, a, if you have a parent, I mean, you know, you got to love our kids. Amen? Might be hard. You can't kill them, so you got to love them, you know? And, and uh, uh, if, you're, if you are a kid, and we're all kids, we all were born of somebody, right? I want to love my mom and dad. I want to be a great, I, all of that. But listen, I also was created for romantic love. Now, when I say romantic love, I'm talking about that goofy, head over your heels, can't hardly breathe, can't, uh, can't control yourself around this person. Uh, there's actually a Hebrew word for it that I'm not going to get into today, but that, that, that just crazy kind of, dare I say, even sexual love. Everybody say it's going to be a good Sunday. Now, how do I know that God created you for that kind of love? Well, because we've been experiencing it since we were a kid. You don't have to teach boys and girls to like each other. In fact, I figured out that a long time ago when I was youth pastor. And you get yourself some good-looking girls, 
and you got something, right? I, I, I pastored a youth group down near uh, Miami uh, years and years ago, and I had four exchange students from Sweden, four Swedish blonde girls. We literally just put their faces on posters and just said, come, you know, that was it. Because you don't have to teach it. It's just there. Now, I can remember the first time I fell in love. It was in the third grade. Nobody can love like a third grader. Her name was Stacy, and it was where my love of southern girls. My wife is from Alabama. Stacy was from Alabama. So kind of a prophetic thing happening there. And I saw her, man, and she had moved to Illinois. I don't know why, but she had that southern accent thing. She had blonde hair, and, and I fell in love, man. And so I, I went up at recess, and I kicked some dirt on her because that's how you did it, <laughs> right? That meant, that meant I love you, you know. And, and we started the dance, you know, the third grade dance. Nothing really happened until about the seventh grade. So it was a four years of incredible uh, just tension. <laughs> I don't think she knew I existed, you know, but, <laughs> but I was kind of shy, you know. And then the seventh grade, and the seventh grade for me was the early 80s. And in the early 80s, they came out with something called the spiral perm. Now, I, I'm not talking about you think you might know a perm, but I'm talking about the spiral perm. These suckers, 10 inches long, and a spiral perm, you know. And it was the thing back in the early 80s. And so I, 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 Stacy comes back to, you know, the, the junior high that I, I knew it was from God because we went to the same junior high. There was only one in our town. But still, we ended up at the same school, which, which just meant something to me. And, and she's even better looking from the summer, and now she's got the spiral perm, and and so I go to my friend Ben, because Ben, he knows everything about women. He's a seventh grader as well, but still, he's, a, he's a very, very educated. And, 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 and I go to Ben, and I said, Ben, I, I've been in love with Stacy since the third grade, and so I need you to help me out. I don't know what to do. I want to I go with her. That's how we did it back in the day. Do they still do that? I, I don't know. I, I still speak in some youth events and things like that. Back, back when I was doing youth camps, I always thought it was funny when I'd have two kids come running up to me, a guy and a girl, and, hey, we're going together. And I'd always be like, where are you going? <laughs> you're, you're at camp. You don't have a car. You know? <laughs> Snack shop. You know, where, where, where are you going? But, but that's how we did it. We go, so so, so ben, and, ben told me, he said, this is the way girls like it, Doug. He said, so you got to you got to write her a note. You can't just say it. you got to write it down. And so Ben and I sat down, and we crafted a piece of love poetry. I'm telling you, it would rival the book of Psalms. It was, it, was, it was incredible. It was incredible. I don't even know how this came out of my spirit, but I sat, I sat down and I wrote it, and I, and I have it memorized for you this morning. It goes something like this. Dear Stacy, do you like me? Because I like you. And do you want to go with me? Christ, I told you it was good, right? And, and, and then, and then I, I did this. Now, if you're single, you might want to take some notes here because this is good. still works today. You, you, uh, I, I put three boxes on the note because I want to make it simple for her, right? And so, like, on the back side, kind of microscopic, I had the no box, you know. I mean, I mean, have you seen me? You know, we don't even need a no box, right? But, 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 and then I had the maybe box, and then I had the yes box, and I surrounded it with hearts and put some arrows on there, and it was quite awesome. And, and so I folded it up, and I gave it to Stacy, and she read it, and she, big as life, checked the yes box, and we were going together. Our love was in bloom, amen. And, and, and so like three weeks later, I go up to talk to her because <laughs> I was a little shy. And, and, uh, and I said to Stacy, I said, hey, hey, are we going together? And she said, uh, she said, yes, and, and I said, okay, well, I'm going to meet you after school, right, because I'm slick, right, I'm going to walk her home, and, and so, I, you know, in the seventh grade, you know, girls are just, they're still slightly icky, you know, at that point, and, and, and walking her home, and I, I knew I should talk to her, but I don't know what girls want to talk about, and, and, then, and then I was supposed to hold her hand, but it, it looked kind of sweaty to me, to be honest with you, and, and, and then... And, and then we got to her street, and, and I knew I should, like, kiss her goodbye or something, but I just kind of said bye and left. And, 
And to no one's surprise, the next day, Stacy wrote me a note with no boxes, and she broke up with me. And that is my first love story. Everybody clap for my love story. Now, what am I trying to say? What I'm trying to say is that God is the one that put desire inside of us. Amen? I didn't have to work for it. I didn't even know what it was. Didn't even want it. Thought girls were kind of icky. And yet it was still there. Listen, it was from God. If you're going to trace your loveology in Scripture, you simply have to go back to the beginning. All of our love stories, they all begin in the same place. They all begin in the garden with a couple, the first love story in all of the Bible, the story of Adam and Eve. Everything we know about love begins with two naked people in the garden. <laughs> Told you it was going to be a good Sunday, right? <laughs> See, we are all sons and daughters of Adam and Eve. And like them, we were all created, male and female, uh, to share that love with another human being. We, we all were created for love. We were set up by God for love. Now, now I want you to get something. I know this seems to be labor, but, it, but it's so powerful. Listen, romantic love, here we go, romantic love or sexual love or marriage itself is a product of creation. It is not a product of culture. This was God's idea, not ours. Everybody say it was God's idea. God's the one that made this up. Now, a lot of times we create credit as human beings for things that really we should not get credit for because God is the one that made up this whole idea of dating, sexuality, marriage, all of that. God is the one who created this. It was God who said this, Genesis 2.18, it is not good for man to be what? Alone. So I will make a helper, I love this, who is just right. Everybody say just right. See, God's got somebody just right for you, just right for him. It is God who said this. This is now bone of my what? Bones. And flesh of my flesh. Now listen, I do this in every wedding ceremony I ever do. In the Hebrew, it, the word bone is an analogy for strength. And the word flesh, it is an analogy for weakness. So what Adam is saying here about his wife is this. He is saying, listen, in all the places that I'm strong, she's weak. And in all the places where I'm weak, she is strong. There's this divine compliment. I'll make a helper that's perfect for you. Amen? And he's saying this, saying, listen, she's weak, I'm strong, I'm weak, she's strong. There's this beautiful divine compliment happening. And so that is why. A man will leave his father and his mother and be united with, the first time any literature ever has the word, be united with his wife. That's what? Obvious? It's even up there, I think. No, it's not. Marriage, right? That is marriage. God made up the idea of marriage. And then the two will become one flesh. That's an analogy for, starts with an S, sex, right? So God is the one who made up this idea of love, romantic love. God's the one who made up the idea of marriage. And God is the one who made up the idea of sex. This is not a cultural thing. This is a creative thing. God made it up. So this whole thing was God's idea. Love, sexuality, attraction, romance, marriage, it all originated in the mind of God. It was his imagination. And what an imagination our God has. Amen? He lovingly crafted this type of love. Now, I want you to get this. Romantic love was embedded into your DNA from the beginning. You can't help it. It's just there. God always wanted you to have this type of love. And in fact, I'll take it one step further. God is never going to stop wanting you to have this type of love. Now, for some, that's easier to hear than others. For some, it's just, okay, obvious, but for others... Maybe your love story isn't quite the love story that we're after. Maybe you've been hurt by love. Maybe you're here and you're divorced. I, I've done a lot of studies on this and a lot of counseling in this arena, and they say that divorce is literally, the, the, uh, emotionally speaking, it is the hardest thing a person will ever go through, even beyond the death of a child. It's just crazy, crazy what people go through in divorce. Those who have made massive mistakes. Maybe you say, Pastor Doug, sexuality is nothing but just a long series of me making mistakes, and I feel so bad about that. Maybe, maybe you're here and you've waited a long time for love. 
Did you know that uh, 50% of our church are single adults above the age of 30? 50%. In fact, even the visitor cards hold that to be true. About half of the visitors that come to our church are single adults above the age of 30. And maybe you're here and you say, Pastor, I've been waiting and waiting and waiting, and, and this is frustrating for me. And maybe you think you're unlovable. I want you to get this, and I want you to hear it from my heart. I say this with love. Listen, there is no hurt that is deep enough. There is no emotional wall high enough. I don't care how high you build it. There is no wait that's long enough. I don't care how long you've been waiting. No experience that's bad enough, no marriage that's tough enough that cancels out the fact that you were made by God for love. Amen? Listen, God loves you too much to let you give up on love without a fight. And God, listen, those of you that are single and you've given up in this arena, God, listen, he will always remind you of the fact that you were built for love. And I'll minister to you more at the end. So how does that part of loveology show up in the Bible? How does the fact that God built us for romantic love, how does that show up in the Bible? Well, even if you were to minimize the story of Adam and Eve, which you shouldn't, but even if you said, well, pastor, that's not a love story, that's just a creation story, Uh, God had to have somebody, you know, populate the earth, whatever. Even if you were to minimize that, you wouldn't read very far into the Bible until you ran into romantic love. What about the story of Isaac and Rebekah, or Ruth and Boaz, or Esther and the king, or even David and Bathsheba, messed up, but it's still a love story. Hosea and Gomer, we talked about last week, or even Mary and Joseph, and there are hundreds more. The Bible is filled with romantic love. Now, one of the things you would have to wrestle with if you wanted to X that out of the Bible is this little book called the Song of Solomon. It's actually a song written by a king who was in love with a pauper. Somebody who was a, well, she was a shepherdess. She took care of sheep even though she was female. And the Bible calls her the Shulamite. And the great King Solomon, the wealthiest man to ever live, the most powerful man of his time, he falls in love with her. He rolls into her town. And you can only imagine the pomp and the circumstance that must have gone with it. And he sees this beautiful, poor Shulamite girl out in the field with the sheep. And he is smitten. And he falls in love. And he takes her and he marries her. And then he writes a song about it. It's bold poetry that that is hard to interpret. And and you cannot read the the Song of Solomon without blushing. (laughs) And you cannot read it without facing the fact that God built you for love. Now... A lot of people try to spiritualize this book. A lot of people, when they get to the Song of Solomon, and you'll find it right in the center of your Bible, and people will get to that, and they'll say, well, Pastor Doug, you know, I, I, you know it's, really, it's really about Jesus and his love for us. And, 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 and I get that. And how many of you know Jesus loves us? Amen? And every time I read the Bible, I'm reminded that Jesus loves me. But I, I just can't get there. I'm not against preachers who do and say, well, it's all spiritual analogies and all that kind of stuff. I just, did you know that God is not even mentioned in the eight chapters? And, and why do we approach a book like the Song of Solomon and throw out the way we interpret the rest of the Bible? We interpret the Bible by three things. We take it for exactly what it says, amen? We take it, too, in context, and the context is big time here. We've got a king in love with a girl. And we are invited into their bridal chambers, unfortunately, and yet we're there. (laughs) Fortunately, amen. (sighs) We have to take it for what it says, and we have to take it for who it was written to. Right in the middle of the Bible, you have this graphic display of romantic and sexual love, and we have to grapple with it. Now, I want you to get this. God knows that romantic love is dangerous. How many of you have been hurt by romantic love? Now, all kidding aside, I I dated a girl in high school, pretty serious relationship. And when we broke up, it, it, it is the deepest pain I have ever felt in my entire life. You say, 17, 16, 17 year old girl, guy, how can he? Listen. When a teenager comes to you and says, I, my girlfriend broke up with me, I think I might be suicidal, take them seriously. Because one, the heart isn't equipped for the dangers of romantic love. And two, it's, it's just incredible. How many of you would say the deepest pain that you've ever felt in your life has to do with romantic love? Any, any, anybody out there? I get it. I get it. I totally understand. 
God knows that romantic love is dangerous. All love is dangerous because all love requires risk. But he still made you and I for love. God wants the best of love for me. Everybody say, God wants the best for me. He wants you to have an abundant life. And just because there are thorns doesn't mean that God wants you to reject the roses. You were built for love. And the Song of Solomon shows us the joy that's possible with this kind of love. Now, I'm not going to read you the whole psalm because it would take too long, but, and, and, I, and I've chosen some of the more mild parts, but I want, you to get, I want you to get some of the language. Let's go ahead and start. Solomon says this. This is the man speaking. How beautiful you are, my darling. Oh, how beautiful. Your eyes behind your veil are doves. Your hair is like a flock of goats descending from the hills of Gilead. Jeannie, when I see your hair, baby, <laughs> I start thinking about goats. <laughs> and it's like they've licked it, and they're just, you, you just, your hair's goaty, man. I'm telling you, it's just. <laughs> and your teeth, Jeannie, they're, they're like a flock of sheep. <laughs> and, and you don't have like one tooth, you know. I know some other people from Alabama do, but you don't have like one, <laughs> one tooth. You got like all your teeth, they got like friends, and, it, and it's like, like they're a pair. <laughs> and they're not alone. All right, keep going, keep going. Here we go. Your lips are like a scarlet ribbon around your mouth, and it's lovely. Your temples behind your veil. I'm, I've never been a temple guy. I, I don't know. Just, did you see that? Did you see the temples on that girl? Uh, uh, like the halves of a pomegranate. Your neck. I've never been a neck guy. Yeah, like the Tower of David, built with the courses of stone, and, and you hang on the shields, and, and they're warriors, and your breasts are like two fawns, and two fawns and the gazelle, and, and <laughs> lots of stuff is happening there. Thank you. All right. Yeah. Until the day breaks and the shadows flee, and you go on to the mirror of the hill of incense, and you are altogether beautiful, my darling. There's no flaw in you. How many think this guy's got it bad? <laughs> Keep going. This is the woman. She, my beloved is radiant and ruddy. He's outstanding among 10,000. You better know it, Jeannie. And his, <laughs> his head is the purest of gold. My, my head is like gold. Yeah, there you go. And, and your hair is wavy and black of the raven, and his eyes are like doves by the water, streams washed in milk and mounted with jewels and his cheeks are like the beds of spice-yielding perfume, and his lips are the lilies dripping in mirror, and his arms, and there's all kinds of other stuff about this guy there. And there you go. Have at it. And these are some of the more mild parts of the song. Now, I want you to get this. God took up space in his revelation to mankind. Get this. This part of the Bible is just as inspired as John 3.16. What do we mean when we say inspired? God uses the personalities of Scripture, their circumstances, but it's not Solomon writing the words, it's the Holy Spirit writing the words. This part of the Bible is just as inspired as any other part of the Bible. Now, you say, Pastor Doug, I don't get it. You know what it is? God took up space in his revelation. We have a Bible, it's limited, amen? Amen. God decided to take eight chapters of that Bible and fill it up with stuff like this. You know why? Because God invented sexuality and romance. He calls it good. And he celebrates it. We are the ones who have altered his plan. Now, I want you to get this. What, what, is this, what does this mean, Pastor Doug, for me? I mean, if I'm young, if I'm old, if I'm married, divorced or not, I, I, I mean, I'm looking for love or experiencing love, dating, not dating, married, whatever, what does this mean for me? The most obvious answer is simply this. There is great power in knowing what God has made you for. You never want to pursue something that God did not create for you to have. And if God didn't create us to experience sexuality, then why does he talk about it so much in his book? No, God created it, amen? And he wants you to have it. We're the ones that have altered his plan. You know, 
the world we're living in is not unlike the Garden of Eden in that we are constantly being offered things that God did not create for us to have in spite of the fact that God created so much for us to have. The Bible tells us in the Garden of Eden that all of the trees, everybody say all of the trees, they were all good for food and they were all pleasing to the eye. And yet there was one tree in the middle of the garden called the knowledge of good and evil that Adam and Eve was told that they couldn't have. And what does Satan do? He draws them in and he says, I know God created all of this and he even created you for each other and even the sexuality aspect of that we have to add into that because Adam and Eve were quite capable of sexuality even before the fall. In fact, I believe this, that perfect intimacy with God and perfect sexual intimacy with one another coexisted. Isn't that crazy? In other words... We didn't need the fall for sex to be invented, right? Adam and Eve had it all. And yet they stand in front of a tree and the liar, the enemy of their souls, the same enemy of your souls, tells them this. And I'm just paraphrasing here, but God is essentially not who he says he is. He's holding out on you. Isn't it crazy to think that the God who invented sex is the first lie we read in Scripture about him is that he's holding out on us. I'm not sure if you can say that the God who invented sex is holding out on anybody, amen? Because if you haven't figured this out, it ain't too bad of a thing. <laughs> God's holding out on you. And, and yeah, he's created all of these other trees, but, but if you just had this one... Well, well, there's another experience, you know, that, 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 that he just, he's hiding stuff. And he, and he yeah, sure, you know, he, you know, you could have that, but I mean, everybody has that. What, what about this? And the world is still cloaking the area of sexuality with mystery that doesn't belong there. We're seeing it in our culture right now. There's a book that was written a few years back that 100 million people have read called Fifty Shades of Grey. This weekend, there's a movie that is being promoted like a Disney film. I unfortunately have been sick all week, and so the TV has been my friend. And I've watched way too much TV. And every talk show, every news channel, local national, you name it. Who's going? Who's got a free ticket? Saw one of the interviews about the movie, and they say they actually hired professional prostitutes, sex workers, to show them what to do. Got to make sure that you get it right. And, and we as a culture are, are, are buying into this. And, and, and Pastor Doug, it's not just, you know, you know God created sex, but, but I mean, there there's, there's must be layers of stuff that we don't know about. And, and, and we need to go and watch some soft porn together to, to, to figure out all the stuff that we don't know so that we as married couples and single people can, can finally discover everything that we're missing. And the married couples that fall for this will find... In four or five months, when all of the mystery is gone again, that there's nothing but emptiness. You know, I had a sexual past before I met Jeannie, and, and uh, I, w I wasn't a Christian uh, for a good portion of my life, and Jeannie didn't. Jeannie was raised in a Christian home. Jeannie was a virgin when we were married. And I can tell you with great conviction that Jeannie did not need the content of my sexual history to make our sex life better. The dumbest thing I think I've ever heard come out of our culture is, well, Pastor Doug, you know, you need to try some stuff and maybe live with a few people and just kind of try because, you know, after all, when you get married, you want to know what you're doing. I, I got news for you. First off, it ain't that hard to figure out. And secondly, that's what makes it so much fun. 
You ought to be, sing, if you're, listen, single people, uh, young people, you ought to be the biggest sexual dork God ever created on your marriage. Amen? Amen. You shouldn't know it all. Why? Because you're going to have the rest of your life to figure it out. And you don't need a lesson, and you don't need a talk, and you, and you don't need to study a website or buy a book. God created you for this. Amen? And, and culture didn't make it up. No, culture's just trying to sell you the lie of the other tree. No, God made it up. Amen? And this is a part of our loveology. And so in this arena of love that God has for you and me, He is not the big ogre saying you can't have it. He's the gifting one. Amen? He's your partner in it. But you got to understand four things. First thing you got to understand is you should be thankful. Everybody in this room needs to collectively take a breath, and I know it seems weird, but we need to thank God that he built us as sexual beings. One simple fact should cause that. You wouldn't be here. Amen? I know it's gross to think about it, but your mom and dad, they were sexual beings. I still deny that fact. I, I think there was some kind of other thing that happened. So if you're single, thank God for desire and ask him to help you to find a relationship that is from him. Amen? And, and know this, that God put Adam to sleep. I, I love that part of the story. The Bible says God put Adam to sleep. He didn't wake him up and go, hey, would you like her to be blonde? You know? Hey, Adam, you know, what, what do you think? You know, you know, are, are you like a net guy like Solomon's going to be? You know, or... What's up? You know, he, he, didn't, he didn't do any of that stuff. He just said, go to sleep. And, and, and listen, if you're single, you need to know this. Sexually speaking, you should be asleep right now. Why? Because God is crafting something for you. And he doesn't need your opinion. Amen? He just loves you and he wants you to have something of great blessing. God made you for love. And God is love. If you're married... God wants you to express romantic love, and you need to start being thankful for it. You know, one thing that will change your marriage is just thanking God for your spouse, just thanking God consistently. The problem is, you know, we think we know all the, no, no, just be thankful. Second thing is context. Purity holds the key to your romantic destiny. God created romantic love and sexual expression of that love to be in the context of marriage. Sex is a spiritual thing. Say it with me. Sex is spiritual. It's spiritual. It is. That's why when we do a wedding, we got the two candle thing, right? What do we do? We take the candle, you know, single, single, married. I was doing a wedding one time, and they blew out the middle candle. <laughs> Seriously. I was like, we should just stop right here. That is a bad sign. We just canceled the whole wedding. We just all went, no, I'm just, we just redid it. But, but the, what, 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 are, what are we saying in that ceremony when we do that? What's that illustration for? It's not an illustration of what's happening I'm a pastor, and I, yes, I am legally qualified to marry people. In fact, I marry people accidentally all the time. That's it. You're married. Oh, you're already married. So, but, but still, you know what I'm saying. And I'm just being stupid. All right. We're, we're not saying that we're watching that happen. No, we're illustrating what's about to happen. The two will become one. And yes, there's a physical aspect to that, but more than that, there's a spiritual aspect to that. And let me prove it to you. The Apostle Paul told us in 2 Corinthians 6 that if a man was to unite himself with a prostitute, he becomes one with her. And it uses the same language that he uses about marriage. Why? Because sex is a spiritual thing. It isn't just, well, we hooked up and this and that, and that didn't mean anything. No, it always means something. You can't join your body without joining your mind, soul, and your spirit. And when you pull yourself away from that oneness that God did not intend for you to have, I can tell you, my friend, and if you're single or you're, or you're having sex outside of marriage, can I tell you, as long as you're violating God's principle of purity, as long as you're destroying the context of romance, you will never experience it like you think you are. You'll never find your romantic destiny while you're destroying the context in which God created romance. And if you're married... The Apostle Paul said, keep the marriage bed pure. 
I, I've heard pastors give talks on sexuality, and, 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 and it's like you're invited into their experience. And I, I can just tell you that my experience with Jeannie is my experience with Jeannie, and you won't find it in my sermons. Because why? Because there's an intimacy there that is for no one but her and I. Now, I will give you some advice if you're married. No outside influence. Pastor Doug, what can we do and what can't we do? No outside influence. That's it. In other words, it's all got to come from the creativity of each other. Other than that, we have a God that stands over the top and says, have at it. I bless this. I love that. I made that. I created you for that. Amen? Amen? But keep the marriage bed pure. Keep it intimate. And, and, and outside of that, absolutely, we have a God who smiled on us. Third thing is this, and that's character. Becoming the right person versus finding the right person. Most single people in this room are in what I call the right person trap. And it goes something like this. Well, Pastor Doug, if I can just find the right person then everything's going to be awesome. I mean, I'm not as happy as I want to be right now. I'm not as fulfilled, but, but if I can find that right person, and, and, and then when we find the right person, and by the way, I believe God has the right person, amen? But even if that right person is the person God has, what happens initially is you have this crazy chemistry. Now, now you might say, well, there it is. I mean, like, like well, you know, I've been waiting for you to say it. See, see, love, sexuality, it's all biological, it's all chemistry. Well, well, it's part of it. Amen? I mean, you thank God for part of it. Absolutely. You better be thankful for the chemistry of it all because, again, it, you wouldn't have sexuality without it, but God is still the one that created that. But when you meet that right person, it's just it's so good, and, and, and we start believing that, that somehow that, that right person, they're going to require for me to be less of a person. I, I mean, after all, Pastor Doug, I'm not going to have to be patient with them because... Well, they're the right person. And all the married people collectively laughed. Hmm. Pa Pastor Doug, I, I, you know, I'm not really going to have to control my anger. I mean, I know I've got an anger problem, but, but, but I could never be mad at them. And all the married people collectively. Here, here's a big one. Pastor Doug, you know, I, I know I have a lust problem. But, I mean, after all, they're the right person, and I'm so attracted to them. And, and once we get married, we can have sex, and so there, there goes my lust problem. No, no, there goes your magnification of your lust problem. Because marriage doesn't solve problems. Marriage magnifies problems. Did you know there's no such thing as a marriage problem? Did you know that? Nobody? Okay. Uh, well, here's the deal. There are not marriage problems. There are actually people problems. And I'm a person, and Jeannie's a person, and when we got married, we brought our people problems into the marriage. Amen? And, and, and so here's what you've got to commit to. One thing. Everybody say one thing. I have to become the person I want to be with. I must become the person I want to be with. All single people say it with me. I must become... The person I want to be with. And in fact, I should have had the married people say it too. Because why? If you're single, your future does not depend on you finding the right person. It depends on you becoming the right person. If you're married, who you're becoming is the only relational factor that you can control. The rest is just wishful thinking. You know, when I was youth pastoring, I used to do something. I called it the top ten list illustration. And I did it every year, and they always forgot every year, but I did it every year. And I, I would take, let's say there was 100 teenagers there, and I would say, okay, I, I, we'd hand out this card, and we'd say, we want you to write down the top 10 attributes that you want in the person that you're going to marry. And then we would we'd, we'd collect them all, and we would you know, take the data and tally it up, and then we would put together the top 10 list for the people we're going to marry for us as a youth group. It was a lot of fun. And I was always amazed every year. At, at a couple of things. One, everybody's going to marry a good-looking person. <laughs> if you're ugly, just forget it because nobody wants to marry you, according to my survey. Yeah. And, and so uh, I, the, good, the good news is that ugly is relative. But, 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 uh, but everybody's going to marry somebody good-looking. No matter how ugly they are, they're going to marry a supermodel. And, and everybody's going to marry somebody rich, right? So all the ugly, poor people, they're not getting married. But the rich, good-looking people, you're getting married. And, and then... 
and then everybody, everybody's going to marry somebody godly. They're going to love Jesus, Pastor. They've got all kinds of money, good looks, godly. This godly, supermodel, rich person. Uh, and, and then it would just go on. And, and, and so every year I would put it up there, and then, and then I would, all of a sudden I would start putting pictures of the youth themselves on the screen. And then we would say this statement, you have just set a very high standard for yourself. Because let me give you a secret. You attract what you are, not what you're not. Your relational future doesn't depend on you reading, meeting the right person. That's a fairy tale. No, reality is the right person depends on you becoming the right person. Jeannie and I have been counseling a uh, well, this is going back a few years. She's been married a few years now, but about five years ago, we were really counseling this girl. She's 20-something and uh, had kind of late 20s and had been single for a while, really wanted to be married, and, but she had all kinds of problems. So we just started pouring the love of Jesus into her and watched her come to church, and God just started doing this incredible work, and she fell in love with Jesus. She, she, she was really, really out of shape. She had just let her body go and and that with depression and all that stuff goes with that. And so she started eating healthy, working out, and started loving Jesus and coming to church. She wasn't a supermodel, but she just started improving herself. And about a year into this transformation of herself, to no one's surprise, Mr. Wright appeared. She's been married five years now. Now, now listen. It isn't about some preacher sticking his finger in your face and saying, you're lonely because you're a bum. You can take it that way, but that ain't the case. It's about saying this. The person that's out there probably deserves better than what you're offering. And you deserve better. Amen? And so you got to become the person. And then the last thing is simply this, and that is fulfillment. Stop asking people to do what only God can do. God is my fulfilling factor. Amen? Now, I love that God put romantic love in me. And I love me some genie. <laughs> I just do. I just do. You can jump back. Because that's what God put in me. And it's there. And it grows. How many of you have been married for a while? No. It It, it, it grows. It isn't something, it's not that it becomes better, it just becomes better. It just does. And, and now I can say that that is a big part of my life, but get this. Romantic love is an experiential love. It's not a fulfilling love. God designed us this way. You can have the greatest love story ever and we'll all go see your movie, okay? But that love will never fulfill you like Christ. Here's what I know. If Jeannie finally came to her senses and went out and married that doctor or whatever, and, and, and I, I all of a sudden, my life was devastated. Would I be hurt? Yeah. Would it destroy me? Yeah. It'd be like a nuclear bomb went off in my life. It would be bad. But would I make it? Yeah. Why? Because she's not my fulfilling factor. Christ is. Something we discovered a long time ago is this. A lack of fulfillment plus a lack of fulfillment will never equal fulfillment. You put an unfulfilled person and an unfulfilled person together, and you're not going to get fulfillment out of that. But if I am fulfilled in Christ and she is fulfilled in Christ, when we are put together, it's like that fulfillment is supercharged, and you get more fulfillment. Amen? And something you need to discover, if you're single especially, but even if you're married, if you want the romance back, get this. Fulfillment is very attractive. I had asked Jeannie out probably 50 times, man. And a lot of you have heard my story, and I'm not going to tell the whole thing. It takes me about a half hour to tell our story. And it is the funniest story I tell, and I'll tell it again sometime. But I had asked her out maybe 40 or 50 times, and she just kept turning me down, turning me down, turning me down. And, and, I, and I finally got to the point where I just said, well, because it starts to wear on your self-esteem, amen? <laughs> and I finally went to God, and I was like, God, how about speaking to me about a girl who actually likes me? You know I mean? <laughs> This pursuing somebody that hates me is kind of wearing on me. And, and so I finally got to the point where I just was like, I developed a little bit of an attitude. And I was just like, well, she don't want this, then that's her loss. 
And I, I just said this. I said, I love Jesus anyway. And so I just started moving on with my calling. And I remember it was a ministry weekend, and I'd invited uh, Jeannie among about 20 others to come on this ministry trip with me. And, and I, I was preaching that Sunday. And I had given up on our relationship that weekend. I just I wasn't going to ask her out anymore. I just I just had given that to God. And, I, and so I walk into the pulpit with this reckless, I like you, but I love Jesus more kind of attitude. I'm going to preach the gospel today and whatever about you. <laughs> and I walked into the pulpit and I let my calling come out. And at the end of that service, Jeannie walked up to me, and I kid you not, if I'm lying, I'm dying. She looked at me, and she said, I'll marry you. It was a good sermon. That was right. It was entitled, Three Reasons Why You Should Marry Me. No, no, it just, this was the, 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 the uh, what, am, what am I trying to say? Fulfillment is very attractive. Amen. When, when I was in high school, and I, I know we got to be done here, but when I, when I was in high school, I noticed something that seems like the jerkiest guys always seem to have the best-looking girls. Anybody ever notice that? You know, it, it's just like, you know, they're just, we call them burnouts. They just care about partying, and that's it, but they always had some babe on their arm, you know, or, or maybe a jock, and all he cares about is sports, but, but there's always some cheerleader on his arm, or, or just some guy that he, all he cares about is his boys and his friends, and, but there's always some babe in love with him. But you ever notice that the sweet guy, you know what I'm talking about, the guy who's got kind of a low self-esteem and, and he's kind of got this all shucks kind of attitude and he, he's a little bit like, you know, I'm not happy, but, but baby, I would do anything for you and, and you're probably not all that happy either, but maybe we can make each other happy. That guy couldn't get a date to save his life. You know why? Because that's not attractive. Nobody wants to be somebody else's fulfilling factor. I don't care what Hollywood says. A lack of fulfillment is not attractive. You are not missing a puzzle piece in the shape of another person. Your only piece you've ever been missing in your whole life is in the shape of Jesus. Amen? Amen. And you get that. You get fulfilled in Christ. You know what the jerky guy's saying? The jerky guy's saying, I know it's in a perverted way, but he's essentially saying, I'm already happy. You want to come join the party, then fine. But I'm already happy. That guy can't stop the girls from coming. The, the wimpy guy, he's saying, I won't be happy without you. And a girl's like, once you get a hold of me, you'll become some kind of weird mass murderer dude or something. I ain't crawling into your hole and letting you whatever. You know, and, and I just every horror movie I've ever seen just came out in my head. I'm just... <laughs> got to be fulfilled in Christ. Amen. You got to be fulfilled in Christ. Pastor, I want the romance to come back to my marriage. Well, get fulfilled in Jesus, man. Because you trying to change them, that's just a fantasy anyway. Why not get fulfilled in Christ? And I tell you, I want all of it. Listen, Jeannie and I, again, we're not supermodels or anything, but, but we care about our physical health. We, we, we both try to eat right. We both work out some. We both love Jesus. We both seek after him. We both manage money well. We both, uh, you get what I'm saying? We, because why? Because if I get off track, it's going to affect my relationship with God and it's going to affect my relationship with her. But if I get on track and she gets on track, oh, baby, we got a love story going, don't we? Because fulfillment plus fulfillment equals a whole lot of fulfillment. And God wants that for you. I want you to stand to your feet all throughout the church. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. Amen. Don't we serve a good God? Well, not, a, not my favorite subject I've ever preached on, but uh, I, I've tried to, tried to do good with what the Lord gave me. And I, I knew it would come to this moment, and especially for a guy who pastors a church that is 50% single adult above the age of 30. Uh, can I, I just say a few things from my pastoral heart? This isn't like thus saith the Lord, but I have to believe that if God created us for this kind of love, then if we're breathing, it's still viable. Amen? So for those of you that have been divorced or 
maybe never married or you're just getting older and you just say, Pastor Doug, I've been waiting a long time. Listen, the principles of this message, they're for you. God didn't put this in you to frustrate you. He may have you asleep in this arena for a while, but one day he wants to wake you up. And he's working on it. Amen? And you don't have to seek after them. Just seek after him. Amen? Something I didn't tell you about mine and Jeannie's story is I had dated a lot the semester before and had a hard breakup over the summer. And I went back to school that fall, my junior year of college, and I had told the Lord, I said, God, I'm not going to date anybody but you. I was just tired of it. I was just tired of getting hurt, tired of putting my, my heart on the line, and just tired of it not working out. And I said, God, I'm going to date you. And so for two months, that's all I did. I was praying three, four hours a day. I was fasting a day a week. I, I was preaching every weekend. I was just living for God. I, I was, man. I was, I was at a Bible college, so there was a lot of opportunities. I was in some form of a Bible study probably six nights a week. Just loving God, loving God, loving God. Two months into that semester, I walk into a chapel and I see Jeannie. And a lot of you know my story. God spoke to me and said, she's going to be your wife. Now, you think he didn't speak to me? We got three kids. What's up? (laughs) He spoke to me. Because why? Because when you start seeking him, he's got you back. Amen? He had it all figured out, and he's got it figured out for you. If you've got a relational past, and you you say, Pastor, I, I, I need to be healed up of that. You've got a sexual past, and you need to be healed up and restored from that. We serve a God who can do that too. Amen? If you're, you're, you're in a relationship with somebody, and you're not being pure with them right now, I'm not going to say that they're not the right person, because maybe they are. But you're never going to know until you stop compromising. You're living with somebody, move out. Move out. What do you mean? I mean move out. Move out. If it's God, it'll last. Amen? And we do weddings. We do. We do. I'm expensive. It's like 20 grand, you know, but it's... No, I'm just kidding. For you, I'll do it for free. We We do weddings around here because we believe in this stuff. Amen? compromise to get what you want don't you know that you compromise to get what you want and you didn't really get it right I gotta lie and cheat to get this thing no God wants that for you in every area I never tried to be your pastor this opportunity ran me down and tackled me because that's the God we serve amen God's saying when I got something good for you you're not going to be able to run from it Jeannie, she is hurt. Man, she had some guy abuse her before me, called her every name in the book, man, was awful to her, thought he was some kind of karate expert. I just jack kicked him, man. No, I'm just kidding. No. <laughs> I don't know why I told you he was a karate expert, but he was. He was like an amateur. I'm pretty convinced that Jesus, he loves most people, but not that guy. But but the, the well, he probably loves them, but just a little, but, but Jeannie had told God, I'm never going to love again, man. I'm not going to do it. She didn't, she didn't know how hard I could stalk her. That's right. She told God she didn't want love. God sent her a stalker. Christian stalker. And I did, man. I went after it because when God's got something for you, he's got something for you. Amen. You don't have to seek it, you seek Him. So Father, right now, in Jesus' name, come on, I want you to pray this out loud with me. Dear Jesus, in this area, I give it to you. I give myself to you, my desires to you, my future to you. Go to work on my behalf. I'm not going to try to seek them. I'm going to seek you. Purify my life. Forgive me for all past mistakes. Restore me emotionally, relationally, mentally, sexually. Restore me. Forgive me. Put me on a good path. I want to know you. I want everything you have for me every kind of love in 
Jesus' name. And Father, I pray over your people right now, especially today. We, we, we don't do enough for them. I, I, I got to do better. But especially for the single adults in the room. God, I pray that you would answer that prayer. Divorce is healed right now in Jesus' name fractures in our soul and our spirit that have caused a, a low sense of worth God in Jesus name heal those right now and I pray God that you would begin to put the wheels in motion I pray God it's a weird prayer but I pray over the next year or two that we'll do hundreds of weddings as we watch you fulfill our lives in every way I believe, God, for those that are struggling right now, especially, I, 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 don't, I don't carelessly talk about those that are living together or whatever. I, I know how hard it can be. I know how euphoric it is to compromise sexually. But God, give us the courage. Come on, whisper and just say, give me the courage, Lord. Give us the courage to make good decisions. God, I pray for a culture that thinks 50 shades of gray is normal. You've created a million shades of wonderful. Forgive us, God, for making something mysterious that's really just a gift. And help us to make changes. Married, single, whatever, help us to make changes in this arena. In Jesus' name. Everybody said. I don't think, no, no, don't clap, but I, I, I don't think there's ever been an area that I don't think in, in, in my six years of being here, I don't think I've ever given a talk where I feel more of a pastoral heart than the one I feel right now. If, if you only knew what God had for you, but stop making it such a problematic, mysterious kind of thing. And, and, and let's not go with the flow of the culture Amen. Let's not go with the flow of the culture. Let's go with God. And as, as we do that, man, man, purity will pave the way to intimacy. And, and, and listen, you don't know what you're missing until you have it. Amen. Amen. I'm going to preach about this every week. Anyway, God bless you guys.